morning and welcome to United Estherville United Methodist Church. I'm Julie Montanda and I'll be your worship leader this morning. Our radio broadcast is in honor and celebration of Sharon Ross's March 23rd birthday from her husband Dennis. Happy birthday, Sharon. For health reasons, the church will always be locked until further notice. If you need to come in, please call the office when you get here at 362-4886. And Nancy will let you in. The office is closed on Thursdays. All committees, groups, both church and outside groups, Sunday school, chancel choir, praise team, Bible studies, circles, United Methodist women, United Methodist men, confirmation, Wednesday night activities, meals, remix worship service, and anything else that meets in the church on a regular basis will not be meeting here until further notice. Thank you for your patience and understanding. Please keep everyone in your prayers. We will still be airing our worship service at 9.30 each Sunday. Only Pastor Kevin and his support staff will be at the worship service. You may watch it on Channel 3 if you have Medicom or live on Facebook. If you don't have either of these, you may still listen to the worship service on KILR 95.9 FM. Make your summer plans now for attending Mission Camp, which will be held on June 21st through the 27th in Fort Wayne, Indiana. This camp is for adults and high school youth in our church to serve the needy residents in the name of Jesus Christ. Youth who have completed eighth grade and up are eligible to participate. Contact Pastor Kevin or the church office to sign up now. Please join me in the call to worship. This is a day to let your heart take control of your lips. We can't keep, we can't silent. keep silent. Our hearts are bursting with the praise of Jesus, Jesus, King of our lives. In spite of the shadow of the cross, Jesus lives in the hearts of those who surrender to him. We commit ourselves wholly to Jesus and ask him to be present in our lives always. Amen. Now our opening hymn, Come Christians, Join to Sing. Share with those who honor him with their lives. In his name we pray. Amen. 
now our call to reconciliation. What shall we do with our sins? Shall we continue to try to hide them or confess them honestly and without reservation to the one who comes to vindicate us? With time afterwards for our personal prayers, join me as we pray together. Passionate God, we confess in our weakest moments that we look for chances to betray you, breaking your heart. We turn our backs on those who reach out to help to us for help. We hide our faces from those who are wasting away from hopelessness. Be gracious to us, faithful God, and stay with us in these moments, morning by morning. Awaken us with your voice of mercy and call us to humble ourselves in service to others, even as did Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, and in whose name we pray. Amen. Sisters and brothers, the Lord is slow to anger, merciful and gracious and abounding in steadfast love. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So in the name of Jesus Christ, know that you are forgiven, that you have always been loved by our God. scripture from Matthew. It's uh, it's not the scripture that I'm going to read today. Uh, how are you anyway, by the way? You doing okay? Social distancing. Social distancing. Okay. All right. Well, I am uh, going to be talking. It's in the 19th chapter. Uh, let's see. Where is it? Well, anyway, I'll paraphrase. Uh, Jesus is sent, sending out the disciples, the great commandment. He sends them out to the world, and he's kind of preparing them for what they're going to find when they go out there. And one of the things he talks about is, is uh, you know, uh, they're going to be in situations that they've never experienced before, periods where they think they're all alone in the world, like maybe some of us feel like today. And he tells them that, you know, he talks about sparrows and that sparrows that the father knows when a sparrow falls to the ground and that um, and they are worth much more than a sparrow. So think about what how the father cares for them. In fact, uh, we, he cares for them much more than many sparrows that he would watch over for us when things are uh, difficult in our lives. And so he sends the disciples out with that information so that they know that God is with them wherever they go, that he is watching over them. And isn't that comforting to know that? Same with us. All right, let's go to God in prayer. 
Most gracious and glorious God, Lord, I thank you so much um, for these children, these, the children that are at home in our churches. Uh, uh, we wish they were here, but we know that that can't happen, Lord. Uh, just be with them, be with their families. Bless each one of them. Uh, bless us today. Watch over us, Lord. We are so grateful for the fact that you are with us wherever we go. And we thank you for that. And all God's children said, Amen. The death of Jesus from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I thought we'd start out with a little humor. This couple, they are together and they are half celebrating their 30th wedding anniversary. And uh, they're in a, their favorite restaurant and it just happens to be, they're both 60 years old. And um, so this angel appears before him and says, you have been such a faithful and wonderful couple. You've been together all these years. You've looked out for each other and so, the Lord wanted me to come down and, and, um, and, and offer uh, two blessings to you, two wishes that you could have, one for each of you. And so the woman decides to go first, and she says, I always thought it would be wonderful. It's on my bucket list, but let's do it now. I'd like to take a, a, a cruise around the world. And poof, just like that, two tickets appear for a cruise that goes all the way around the world uh, for the two of them. And, and what a wonderful gift. And so then it goes to the man. And the man says, you know, I have everything I need, but you know, if there was one thing that I could wish for would be, you know, my wife is lovely now, but 30 years ago, she was so much lovelier. So I, my, my, my wish would be that my wife would be 30 years younger than me. And poof, he turned to be 90 years old. <laughs> so be careful what she wished for. <laughs> so first things first you see I don't like the term social distancing I, I would prefer to call it physical distancing because I still think that we're connected socially uh, and we're together whether we're in this church building or not we are together the church is not this building the church is the people yeah, so we, we still look each, out for each other. We still pray for each other, despite the fact that we're uh, at a distance from each other. And regardless of the situation. Now, in my newsletter post that's coming out in April, I also posted it on Facebook. Uh, I, I used uh, the scripture from Paul's letter to the Philippians. Now, in all the letters that Paul wrote to uh, the churches, they were always usually in response to a crisis that was going on in that church. But Paul wrote this letter to the Philippians to express his gratitude and his affection for the Philippian believers. In this letter, Paul wrote that he was pouring out his life as an offering for the sake of Jesus Christ, which gave him great joy and contentment. Though we have much to be thankful for, the consequences that we're dealing with now, the coronavirus in our daily lives has a, can squeeze the joy out of us. And we find some days, weeks, maybe even months, they're difficult for us to endure. 
So where do you try to find the joy in these kinds of circumstances? I believe today's message from our sermon series is more than just a message. I believe it's a God incident made for what we're dealing with right now, where we might feel abandoned by God and wonder where he is in the midst of the crisis of the coronavirus, the crisis that we deal with in our lives today. Before we go on, let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be a pleasing and acceptable sacrifice to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Now each of the Gospels adds to the scene on that day of the cross when Jesus was crucified. Most of Jesus' seven statements came from John's Gospel. That's because of where he was situated. He was right beneath the cross. And we know that from John 19, 25. It says, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, also Mary Magdalene, and next to them was John. So from John's position, he could hear all seven of Jesus' words. However, Matthew, Matthew was farther away, quite farther away. And all he could hear is this one statement, probably because Christ called out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew writes in his gospel, verse 45, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the land. Now scientists can easily predict solar eclipses. They always occur during a new moon because the moon is, has to be between the earth and the sun. However, the crucifixion occurred right before the Passover, which is always during a full moon. So that would be the opposite of a new moon. And in addition to that, a solar eclipse can only last as long as eight minutes, not the three hours of darkness that happened during the crucifixion. So as we see, this was truly a miracle. And so at three in the afternoon, with the sun refusing to shine, outside the gates of Jerusalem, at a place called Golgotha, Jesus has been on the cross for nearly six hours. And at this time, he cries out in Aramaic long enough for Matthew, one of his disciples, to hear, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, I want to jump to the Old Testament because as miraculous as it was for this to have a, a darkening of the sun for three hours, how is it any more miraculous that in Psalm 23, 22, written centuries before the crucifixion, that was accurate to what was happening that day? Psalm 22, I'm just going to read the first verse. This is, from, um, a, this is from David, the King David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? That first verse of the psalm was Jesus' statement on the cross. Now, it has been suggested by many that Jesus was simply repeating that psalm to himself as a picture of his own situation. Of course, that psalm uh, ends on a high note, a very high note, as a, a confidence in God, uh, because the situation ends on this high note when Christ rose from the tomb. And Christ knew that would happen. There's a, a biblical scholar, his name is William Barclay, and he said this about Jesus reciting this song from David on the cross. It's an attractive suggestion, but on the cross, a man does not repeat poetry to himself, even the poetry of a song. 
then again, Jesus was no ordinary man. Jesus quoted scripture for everything else in his life. Why not on the cross? And I do believe that at this moment when Christ called out, truly the sins of the world were cast down, thrust upon him. In our scripture, uh, the Father had hid his face from Jesus as Jesus took on our sin. It was an agonizing feeling for the one who lived in total intimacy with the Father, depending on him each step of the way. How many times did you see Jesus go off by himself to spend time alone with the Father? How many times did he pray to the Father to seek strength? As painful and as physical cruelty the cross was. I believe the pain of isolation and separation from the Father during that time hurt more than any nail piercing through anyone's skin. But I don't believe the pain stopped with the Son. Can you imagine how hard it was for the Father to look down upon his Son, to have to turn away as his Son paid the price for our sins? So while he's on the cross, and there's people all around him, people that he knew and that he loved, in this moment of pain and anguish, Jesus felt abandoned, felt alone. And that's what makes this scene so powerful. Because in this moment, Jesus abandoned him. Jesus, these feelings that he had, are the same kind of feelings that we go through of abandonment, of being alone, thinking we're the only one around that knows what we're going through. It may be because it seems like the whole world has been turned upside down right now. Uh, everything we have come to expect is not the case anymore. Things that we used to take for granted are no longer the situation. Things we've come to expect are not there. And you may, in your home right now, cry out to God asking why He has forsaken us. Where is He in the midst of our pain and suffering? Now, in my personal life, I love routines. I despise the unexpected. I love daily routines. And I think the older I get, the more I like enjoying routines. Every day, everything's laid out for me. I know exactly what I'm doing each minute of each day. So in this, before this mess happened, listen, I think our church was really in a groove. I believe so. We were on fire and everything was going great. Then all of a sudden, things have turned upside down. Things have changed. Our routines, my routine has changed. And we're no longer in the same lane. You may, might say that it is a dark mess that we find ourselves in. And it's in this midst of dark mess when we wonder, where is God in this? Now don't get me wrong. Coronavirus pales in comparison to some of the things that you are going through or you have gone through. For some of our darkness comes when the diagnosis of cancer for us, or even worse yet, for one of our loved ones. And we feel isolated and alone, and in that case, we wonder where God is. For some, the dark valley comes when we see our jobs lost, our investments gone and everything that we work for disappears and we ask God where he is in the midst of this crisis for some it comes as we battle depression some comes from abuse or feeling unworthy for some it comes in the midst of an accident or 
an unexpected tragedy. It's in these moments we cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The word forsaken is not used much in today's world. The word forsaken means abandoned, leave in a lurch, leave stranded, turn one's back on, cast aside, jilt, dump, and ditch. Now I'm sure that each of you have experienced one or more of these in your life. Being dished or jilted is never pleasant, is it? But that's kind of small potatoes compared to some of the other things that we go through in life. The young, and, young men and women who go to war, separated from loved ones at an early age in their life. I can't imagine how that must feel for them. Or those who have to battle cancer, heart disease, or endure dialysis as some of our members do. And I know that you've felt alone and abandoned. I know that. I've heard you talk. We don't choose to get sick, do we? We don't choose to have relationships fall apart. We don't choose to battle depression. We don't choose to battle addiction or go through an economic crisis or go through failure. We don't choose these things that happen to us or that are happening to us right now. You know the phrase, stuff happens. But with Jesus, it's different. With, it's different with Jesus. Jesus chose this road. He knew where it would lead him to the, his place of abandonment. Jesus chose to carry the cross and he knew that he would experience isolation. So some believe that in this moment, Jesus not only felt abandoned by the Father, his Father in heaven, but because of our sin, he actually was forsaken by his Father. Even if it was only for a moment. But there are others, however, who interpret this word of Jesus. My God, my God, how, why have you forsaken me? They interpret this a little differently, and here's why. Does God really ever abandon or forsake someone? Even when he willfully turns away, he never really forsakes us. And even when we willfully turn away from God and walk in sin, God does not forsake us and turn away from us. The Bible is pretty clear that God doesn't do this. I'll tell you, footsteps in the sand comes to mind. Now you all know the poem. If you don't, it, it, it describes an experience in which a person is walking on the beach with God. And there are two sets of footprints in the sand. The tracks represent different stages of the person's life. And the two trails dwindle to one, especially at the lowest points, the most hopeless points in that person's life. And when questioning God, this person believing that the Lord must have abandoned him during those times, God gives, gives him this explanation. During your times of trial and suffering, when you see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. God is always with us. Even in the darkness of sin, God, God does not keep away. So did the darkness of our sin placed on Jesus really force God away, or did it just feel like it? The truth is that whatever we walk through dark and difficult places, and whenever we willfully turn to sin, it feels like God is on my 
going out in life, and then suddenly, zap, everything shorts out right there in my cockpit. All my instruments are gone, my lights are gone, and I can't even tell now what my altitude is. Uh, I know I'm running out of fuel, so I'm thinking about, uh, about ditching in the ocean, and I, I look down there, and then in, in the darkness, there's this, uh, there's this green trail. It's like a long carpet that's just laid out right beneath me, and it was the altitude. It was that phosphorescent stuff that gets churned up in the wake of a big ship, and it was, it was, it was just leading me home. And now, if my cockpit lights hadn't shorted out, there's no way I'd have ever been able to see that. So, uh, you, uh, you never know what, what events are going to transpire to get you home. So when we feel abandoned, I think that everything is going against us, that God has let us down. We need to remember that first of all, Christ understands our feelings, understands that feeling. He gets it, but he doesn't let it get him. His cry reminds us that not only does God hear us when we cry out in despair, but God comes to save us. No matter what the darkness or the despair that we face, no matter in life, no matter what the darkness and despair we face with this virus, the thing we need to remember is that God loves us, God loves you, and God is with you, and God is here to save. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.
organization and we depend solely on you to pay our operating costs. Now, I'm not a TV evangelist and I don't want to be. Uh, please consider throwing a check in the mail or you can call the church office and arrange a payment. But now let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, help us not hold back our treasures but out of, out of fear, but help us to pour them out so they might be used to transform all those who find themselves abandoned. Abandoned, maybe hungry, maybe lonely, all these things that are out of their, nothing on their part. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Sisters and brothers, this week, look for blessings. Look for Jesus. Look for God working in your life through this time of a bit, what feels like abandonment because he is working. We're seeing blessings right and left. It is so awesome. I am so excited for what God is going to show us and reveal to us through this, um, what we're dealing with this crisis. Now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Sisters and brothers, wherever you go, whatever you do, love and serve the Lord. Amen.